Incoming transmission. The Klingonese word of the day is LUT. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. So, this is a huge victory for the good guys. Scotty, beam me up. Resistance is futile. Live long and prosper. And welcome to the Computer Resume Podcast, the show covering the entire Star Trek franchise in chronological order for fans new and old. I'm your host, writer-comedian, Mr. Todd A. Davis. You can catch her every week at the legendary Barracuda Lounge in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, ripping it up with the infamous Star Trek drag variety show to proudly go. From New York City. New York City! It's Heather Wood, yeah! Yay! Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. And thank you so much for carving out the time. I imagine you are uh, up to your eyeballs, (laughs) busy all the time. Yeah, you know, just trying to make my way back from the Delta Quadrant or the Lambda Quadrant or wherever the... Ever the hell I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we appreciate you carving out the time so much for us, Captain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me let's let's dive right in. Um, take me back. Well, you know, when when I've had uh different artists on the show before, I usually ask them the question, what came first, the art or Star Trek? So which which came which came first for you? The art of drag? Or uh, a fondness for the Trek franchise. I mean, thank you so much for calling it art. You're really elevating me here. Oh, uh, it's totally an art. Totally def- an art. Yeah, I will have word. I will have words with anybody who says otherwise. <laughs> Definitely, um, I started doing drag first, but but I will have to say before, like I got, I was working mm-hmm. at a job that I quite loved, but I got laid off, and it was devastating. So. Mm-hmm. Instead of being, um, you know, responsible with my severance, I just pulled out that credit card and spent it all on drag. Um, I was doing these like pride uh, kickoff parties at my apartment, which was fairly large at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always hired a drag queen to do to like perform, like paid them like a hundred bucks to do like two numbers. But that year I decided, you know what? I'm just going to do drag. I'm going to do it. I mean, it can't be that hard. <laughs> um, the last words then, of anybody who ventures into an art form. <laughs> and that's how I basically became, was born, you know, and mm. I didn't really go out. Like I practiced a lot at home and I did have, like, I took audio from the Star Trek episodes as Captain Janeway. And I remember I would, my friends would come over. I did put myself into drag and kind of like practice a little bit. And I would put up these, um, I would, I would do these performances as Janeway and then everybody was like, Oh God, Star Trek again. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think my drag persona is definitely inspired by, uh, Kate Mulgrew's Captain Janeway portrayal. Um, definitely a very, very strong influence from that. So when I started doing drag, I, it's like they just, it came full circle. So, mm-hmm. you know, so that was, that was lovely. But I had been doing drag for, I started in 2014. And I, um, you know, so then, then I started doing the Trek stuff, I think in like 2019. So I've been doing drag for about, what five years there yeah. my math is i'm not really a scientist so um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so and then the rest is history wow so i you know safe to say i mean because i've seen uh i i have been lucky enough to see at least one performance of to proudly go and it was absolutely magical because it was my very first drag exp- uh drag show experience what uh, yeah, yeah, that night was my Ever? very first. Yeah, that was my very first drag show. I had an absolute blast. 
And now anybody you see will be like, wow, that was really setting the bar so low. Everybody else is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, you know, I, you know, I, I had started developing an affinity for, uh, for the art form. And I, we talked a little bit about this off mic uh, yesterday in our sound check and everything, but like, I, I, you know, I'll compare it to working as a, as a, as a stand-up comedian, like as you get into, to stand up, you start to see like all the nuances of writing and performing and editing through performing and all of that to refine this art. When it comes to drag, it seems like in addition to being a personality on stage, let alone singer, dancer, what have you, there's also the costume, the shoes, the hair, the makeup, the, I, I, and I'm sure I'm forgetting at least a dozen other things. And it's just like, like, ref I mean, and there's drag artists that yeah. are really <laughs> solid standups and it's like, oh, all of that and stand up like my hats off like it is it is i am i am intimidated by anyone who regularly performs uh in the, in the drag arts because it's just like uh, there's so many nuances to it uh so the utmost respect for well, everyone uh yeah yeah uh so let me so let me ask you this uh or did, did i cut you off did you have something oh no no keep going oh okay <laughs> so <laughs> All that to say, uh, and I've seen your regular headshot as well as your performance, and it's clear like Janeway is is a big is a big part of your current drag persona. So, yeah. looking at Star Trek as a franchise, um, which for a long time was very uh, male dominated or you know male figure heavy, it was uh, uh, you know, and that's that's not a secret. I'm not you know shocking anybody here i'm shocked uh, yeah i know <laughs> Ima imagine a tv show developed in the 60s where it's mostly dudes hmm. <laughs> but looking at uh you know especially once we got into like the tng era with you know tng deep space nine voyager and enterprise um you know times change things change productions change and we did see more women coming in as uh not only as performers but as these characters and yeah. the, the further development of the franchise and now in new trek like we're seeing even more diversity so all of that and, and that's all a precursor to say do you consider janeway your captain yeah well you know i i have to say when i i didn't really watch any of the series i mean mm -hmm. i'd seen episodes i hadn't watched every episode except when voyager came on i made it a point i wanted to watch every episode I think just because I was a kid, just kind of discovering who I am and yeah. didn't realize at the time I was fabulous. Um, ah. <laughs> I just was drawn to the show because of it, there being a female captain. I just knew it would be a different show. I loved the story of them being in, um, you know, the, like being lost in space. And I just thought that that was like the epitome of exploration. And I think Kate Mulgrew's portrayal was just so uh, magnetic, you know, electric. It was just, she's, was just so fascinating. I loved her character. I always wanted to see more of her. No offense to any of the other actors or storylines or whatever, but it's hands down Janeway. I could have literally just watched the Janeway show, um, which yes. it, it was many many times <laughs> like oh that. yeah yeah i you know for for myself and I, I don't, we didn't really discuss this but i i grew up um with uh captain jean-luc picard um yeah. i came in at that era and to be honest picard actually kind of looks looks like my dad a little bit so there's <laughs> there's definitely some psychological stuff going on beneath the surface there but as i got older and continued in my fandom I was able to sort of uh, compartmentalize my thoughts about the different captains. And I ended up coming to the conclusion of Picard might be my favorite captain, but Janeway is the best captain. And I, <laughs> and I felt, and I felt that way for a long time because like you said, she's lost in space. Her ship was not meant to be out that far. Half of her crew yeah. wanted her dead before they left space dock. Um, she integrated a Borg into the crew and Borg technology into the ship 
And for the most part, she got everybody home. Like, yeah, you know, Picard, as as great as he is, he had the Swiss army knife of ships and crews. Like there was there was yeah. nothing they couldn't handle. So, yeah, yeah I think Janeway, I mean, and then Janeway wanted to get home so bad. Her future self came back from the, you know, the future. Yeah. And like, We're going home. <laughs> like, <laughs> I kind of also feel like in this, I mean, you know, it's 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 a story. They have to do the story. But um, why did she have to come back at that time? Why didn't she come back sooner? <laughs> <laughs> really? You couldn't uh, you couldn't have popped in when we were at Deep Space Nine and said, hey, you might want to wait a few. <laughs> Like, um, hey, so you couldn't have come back before my fiance decided to marry someone else? Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are my dogs dead, too? <laughs> so let's let's shift a little bit from um, so you, we talked about, you know, you getting started in drag and you started uh, sort of. You know, you really latched on to the Janeway character and sort and sort of, uh, you know, let that sort of meld with your own personality to to bring about this uh, this drag stage performance persona. So where did uh, when in all of this did to proudly go start? Like, what was the genesis? And, you know, what was it like in those in those early days of setting up to proudly go? Well, I uh, I was active with a different organization. Remain will remain unnamed, <laughs> and uh, I admittedly I did not really have a very positive experience with with that. But with my time, I um, you know they wanted me to do drag, and I got a chance to work with Jackie Cox, um, at one of the oh. first things, and yeah. So and I I known. Uh, her in like the New York City drag scene for a while. Not that we were best friends or anything. Um, uh, but uh, I started a viewing party and it eventually, you know, it I kind of left it. Um, but it, that's where it kind of started the show piece and realizing, yet yeah, there, there is a bucket full of queer nerds out there that there's a market for this. Not that it's about making money because it's it's obviously not i don't i don't make money in drag it's all in service really mm. it's the caught but which is totally fine but so i left that i ended up going to a different group and i just kind of felt through that those two experiences that i just really wanted to do my own thing that was inclusive and like cast a wide net of like bringing folks in from different uh like you know people that just walk and just want to be part of something and volunteer mm -hmm. and and help out with what we we're doing and to try to really make this um sort of uh phil philanthropic trek community like really like bring that to life and so um the co-founder of to proudly go chris murphy and i um were talking during the pandemic it was like december 2020 and mm -hmm. Probably very late at night and um, probably a little bit tipsy. <laughs> and we just those are, the, of, those, those are the best discussions, really. <laughs> and we just kind of decided. And there were some working names that we were coming up with. And we stumbled on to Proudly Go. And, you know, we filed the paperwork. Um, we got the, the um, sort of approved certificate of incorporation um, date March first 2021 and that's when it really officially started and but we um you know it, we have lofty goals right um we are about celebrating sci-fi promoting the queer nerd community mm. and partnering with important community causes and organizations and during our time doing the shows at barracuda lounge um which has been about two and a half years over a hundred shows we've done I, I literally, you would be shocked. We have like almost, or if not over, 400 different Trek mixes and performances that we've done. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's staggering. My itself alone, I have like almost 200 songs, Jeez, <laughs> like mixes please. that I've done. Yeah. So we keep it fresh, but we've been able to raise um, 
if not over, if not uh, like close to ten thousand um, uh, dollars, over ten thousand dollars during our our time in existence. So wow. um, I'm really proud of that. And we have a really dedicated crew. We, um, you know, we we take our jobs very seriously, mm. and but we also are very serious about having fun. So. Um, you know, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I am so grateful um, to have this go on as long as it has, and hopefully it will continue um, as the years go by. Um, but yeah, it's been a wonderful experience. So that's awesome. But, you know, check us out at to proud to go dot org. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. We, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we've got. Um, if anybody's listening and is just and just chomping at the bit. Uh, make sure you look in the show notes because we're going to have the links for everything to proudly go. It's going to be all there. And of course, uh, on social media as well. Um, but let's get back into, uh, you know, sort of the the regular thing with to proudly go <laughs> based on the one performance I, I was lucky enough to attend. It's it's kind of a mishmash of like drag performances but also you guys do trivia and it's and you do viewing parties of like the new episodes when they come out and i mean it is just it is just a nerd yeah it's a jam-packed nerd heaven and and so i wanted to ask like as things have been cranking up with new trek and we've seen a couple of characters from Voyager get some love in mostly Picard, but also in, uh, you know, in animated form, be it on Prodigy or on Lower Decks. Uh, how has this been for you as a big Janeway fan to see kind of this resurgence of Janeway love? Like, what do you what do you think of the the new versions of old favorites as they've been presented in new track i love to say uh i mean i'm new to the sort of conventions and things like that but mm -hmm. i remember i was at the chance to be on the star trek cruise and like performed and kind of worked for free but um i did hey. get a free cruise so that was great um yeah but i came out of my cabin and like there was like these group of people like down the hall, like almost on the other end of the ship. And they're like, Oh, Oh my God, that's, that's Janeway. And I was like, I, I just was like, Oh God, I need to go the other way. <laughs> but they found me, they wanted pictures. And I was like, that was like early days of my Janeway persona, but they were hungry for it. They, I, Kate Mulgrew, if you're listening, honey, thank you for the work, but, People want you. They need you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fine to pick up the slack. I really am. Oh, do you think, uh, I mean, this is kind of fantasy uh, wish list type stuff. Do you, uh, do you think they'll ever, do you think they'll ever pull the, pull the trigger on a legacy Voyager series, whatever, whatever form that takes? You know, I would love it if they did. Um, but I mean, who knows? I, I have my opinions about Paramount and their decision-making oh, <laughs> skills. Sure. I feel like they, you know, I, I get it. it's they're, they're the ones that are, I guess, in a way, the experts on this, but I do feel like give the fans what they want. You know, they want Janeway. They want legacy. Yeah. They want seven of nine. They want all of that. And, and I think that's what they should focus on. Um, as well as doing the other stuff. Um, I think Star Trek is just one of, it's probably, I would say, I mean, I, I think it's a very incredibly valuable property. Oh, yeah. That, and I don't feel like it's ever been given its full potential. You know, it's not like, you know, Marvel and the Star Wars, you know, they take those things, they can make theme parks out of them or like rides and the merch and all that stuff and, and, you know, I, I feel like they should take more effort to consolidate some of those things because Star Trek could really pay for itself with many other other things. So, oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, and even seeing stuff coming out of the UK and Germany. Uh, I know Germany has a really big uh, Star Trek fan collective over there. So does Ireland. 
uh canada does as well i mean there i mean there's trekkers all over the place i truly i mean you know i've been lucky enough to go on trexpert's quiz which is based out of australia uh, there's there is no shortage of trekkers all the way around the world if you walk up Wherever you're at yeah. on this planet and you hold up the live long and prosper sign, there's a good chance someone else will do it, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's Star Trek is it's 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 just so special. There's something for everybody in Star Trek. And there's been so many amazing firsts that they've put out there. The first interracial kiss, you know, the first yes. female captain, like not just a first actress playing the boss on anything yeah. um really yeah. and so those were incredibly big deals and there's obviously more that we could that we could talk about um but uh you know i just feel like it's there's something for everybody it's so important that we have a positive outlook on the future and something to help us dream and you know imagine those possibilities because we can get there we can yeah. And there's a lot to feel down about nowadays, but we do for have sure. to remain positive and hopeful. And that's what I think Star Trek reminds us for. And like, you know, about things about equality and fairness and, you know, humanity, you mm. know, I feel like sometimes we really lose those perspectives in today's world. And we really, Star Trek is such a great reminder for all of us. Yeah. When we see these stories and these crews and these characters about how important that really is. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think and it's not a it's not a secret to anybody who watches Star Trek regularly or you know, people who listen to this show regularly that I've said numerous times that now more than ever, do we need this franchise that promotes hope? Um, but the diversity it has it's it is more diverse now than it ever has been in front of the yeah. camera and behind the camera and let's let's get into let's get into this episode a little bit yeah. because i want to know how you felt about going back and watching this episode the elysian kingdom and uh what were your just kind of surface level thoughts about this weird <laughs> this weird little episode where it's like we're in space no wait we're in medieval times now like uh, th there's <laughs> it's a it's a wacky it is a wacky shift but it works so well what were your initial thoughts uh on rewatch of Elysian Kingdom uh, staying staying spoiler free for now well I know I don't know if this is a spoiler but I've never seen the bridge look so good <laughs> <laughs> I really love that color that they had. It was like kind of like this Tiffany's sort of yes. color. And yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, it did seem very royal. Um, yeah. And I do think like, well, just the acting, like mm. I did, they're, they're changing up their characters. They're all different. And I just thought everybody did such a great job, you know, I mean, I had the opportunity to witness um, an actress do her audition take. I can't really talk any more about it than that. But um, just to see the work and how, like, I, sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I feel like I dabble in acting. After watching this, I was like, that is insulting to actors everywhere because <laughs> <laughs> this is hard. It's hard to do. But, like, the sort of subtleties and the 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 way that the things are different and need to be changed up in the headspace you have to be in to, to kind of do all that, I, I think is just really, it's, there's a reason why we yeah. love these actors, these characters, because it's the work, the work, the, 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 the stories that they bring to life. I mean, it's just so impressive. And there, this is, there's no exception here with this episode. Yeah, and I, you're absolutely right. You're hitting the nail right on the head. There's, there were so many things. To be honest, there were so many things I had forgotten about with this episode. And you're talking about the performances, and it's easy to point to Pike, uh, him being kind of. I mean, he is the captain of this show. Quite, you know, yeah. not only the character, but he's kind of front and center all the time. 
but and and because of his turn in this episode and sort of playing a very different character than he normally would um but the the person that really that really um that i had forgotten had this type of uh turn in this episode was Jess Bush as Christine Chapel and when she <laughs> i i will I'll, I'll save it for spoiler territory but she gets she gets an equal uh serving of being able to chew some scenery and a display of absolutely perfect comedic timing and it's you know something like that is really tough cuz i'm always quick to be like well was that in the script was that um, a, a note from the director was that an acting choice? But to be honest, comedic timing is one of those things that is really, really difficult to nail down in a script or from a director. It's you kind of have to have that in your bones somewhere. And there's yeah. so many instances where a lot of people just get to take this cuz i mean don't get me wrong this is star trek is uh, it's there? it's like a it's a pope job uh you know jimmy fallon des- or jerry seinfeld described hosting the tonight show as a pope job you do it until you die and star trek is kind of <laughs> like that in that once you're cast as these characters yes you can go on and do other things but you're going to be captain so and so from the uss whatever for the rest of your life. And that's wonderful, but it's, it's an extra special thing when you get to, as that character embody somebody else. And yeah. uh, this, and this episode is just slam full of that. But uh, I can see that we both want to really dive into the nitty gritty. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get to this week's recap. Okay. I'm excited. I know <laughs> me too. <laughs> Brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, Rev J, Jerry Antimano, Cosmic Crit, Kitty B, David Willett, Ed Milner, Fleet Admiral First Class Fred Sims, and Ren, Space Monkey 73, and Steph Overman. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hail the king. The king. The king. What the hell? An entity has somehow trapped our ship. That's disappointing. And turned the crew into characters from a children's book. The book. They said made you the hero. Until we undo all of this. Kneel before me. Yes, of course. We are stuck here. If you should fall in battle, (laughs) I will sing. Epic song. Great. Enterprise is surveying a nebula when its warp drive fails, causing the crew to black out. Mbenga awakens to find the Enterprise's interior dressed as the high fantasy setting of Rukia's favorite book and the crew unknowingly portraying its characters. And on that note, we cue the music. Hemmer is the only other crew member aware of the situation, thanks to his telepathic abilities, and they discover that the nebula has its own consciousness, comparable to a Boltzmann brain. Whatever that means. They find Rukia and learn that the nebula has detected her loneliness and created the fantasy to entertain her. It also cured her disease. How convenient. But this will not last if they leave the nebula. Sucks. The nebula offers to preserve Rukia by converting her into an energy being within the nebula, which Mbenga reluctantly agrees to. Great. He then sees a vision of Rukia as a grown woman, having experienced a life of adventures with the nebula, whom she calls Deborah after her mother. Deborah releases the Enterprise, restoring its warp drive and interior design. And there was much rejoicing. No one other than Mbanga can remember the fantasy reality, and he tells Una about Rukia's fate. Hello. 
This is Elizabeth Dennehy from Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Picard, and you are listening to Computer Resume Podcast. Okay, so there's so many things going on here. Um, uh, what's what's the, what's the big, what's the number one thing uh, jumping out at you about this episode? Uh, it's, you know, it screams classic sci-fi, but there's also a heavy Dungeons and Dragons vibe to this as well. <laughs> Um, what's, what's, uh, what's top of your list to discuss with the Elysian well, kingdom? I do think, um, it's definitely, uh, Babs Ala Samakan. Mm. I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I should say, am I mispronouncing that correctly? Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's definitely his, it's definitely a, his episode episode and he's phenomenal um the ending is heartbreaking and also uh wonderful and loving so mm. it's it's like the act he's just delivers an incredible incredible performance fantastic actor so i think that's one of the biggest thing the biggest moment of this is just his story and the story about his daughter and her disease and how he has to kind of let that go i really loved how they tied it into this children's book which i'm like where can i get that book right. um <laughs> but um i thought it was really well done and everybody I, I have to say, I just, I do love Ortega's Melissa Navia. She's yeah. amazing. Um, yeah. She really, and you know, Celia Rose Gooding as a horror, she plays a bitch so well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and Anston Mount, which is like this very aristocratic, queeny, you know. Slimy, old- weaselly. <laughs> <laughs> I even love like Hemmer is like when you know there's this part in the episode where uh Anson Mount's character uh runs away and Hemmer goes, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, like what is going on? <laughs> yeah. And you know, looking at the you know, it's so funny because I think back to I think back to the episode of of Next Generation where it was Riker, Worf, and Data, and they show up uh, in that casino. And there's a couple of questions, but they're just kind of like, okay, let's just kind of mingle into the crowd. And Banga is not interested in playing the role. Like, he... You know, given a couple of things for him to go, yes, I'm the king and this, that, and he's like, no, what's going on here? <laughs> and I think that's an interesting turn because yeah. we see him and just like you said, this is his episode and we're getting yeah. to see that he is different from every other uh, chief medical officer that we've seen before. He's not, he's not going to yeah. play the game. He's he's there to get the job done, you know, against, uh, you know, him working on his daughter's disease, regardless of sleep or other duties like the man is dedicated and like he is unstoppable. And we find out, of course, you know, later in season two, a little bit more of why that is. But we'll we'll save that. We'll save that for another episode. (laughs) But it reminds me a lot of the Cupid episode from yes. TNG, yes. actually, because it's they're kind of in that Q's world. Mm. I mean, they play off kind of similar themes in Star Trek, but I mean, it's but obviously this is totally different. But I I think it's very similar to that where they're you know Worf's like I am not a merry man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of like Hammer kind of has that a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, you know, I was thinking of Jess Bush and and her comedic turn. Uh, I mean, OK, so let's go ahead and start at the top. Anson Mount as this slimy, weaselly, uh, just kind of uh, uh, kiss ass kind of character yeah. is so <laughs> funny. He is he yeah. has and he's had a couple of turns like in the episode. Uh, Spock amok where you know Spock and T'Pring switch Katras you can yeah. see him kind of look at the situation and you can almost hear his eyes rolling of like 
what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we get we get to see a little bit more of that here where it's just him doing these funny little eye darting mo- he says so much with his eyes. He says so yes. much with his eyes. And yes. so I, you know, I could sit here and praise Anson Mount all day. But let's okay, so Anson Mount is amazing. Yes. Jess Bush as this sort of witchy type uh swamp <laughs> a doctor, uh, you know, healer type person in medical. And she, you know, waves her hands and does the things. So oh, yeah. once, <laughs> once, uh, once Lon comes in as this big sparkly princess, which is again, another hilarious turn. She's got oh, the dog goodness. with her and does the, you know, singing. I just wanted to be like, she's not acting. That's how she is in real life. Exactly. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but that but that one that one turn where you see Jess Bush lean into frame over to Mbenga and go, Yeah, what is her dopamine level? <laughs> it's yes. like higher than normal. And she goes, okay, and then just leans out of frame. I was like, that is some wonderful comedic timing, writing, and camera work. That is such a perfect, perfect comedic moment. I but absolutely I think- adore it. I think the Emmy has to go to the puppy. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Just and the Emmy goes to Fluffy. <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I, I actually did. Uh, so I went and rewatched the episode uh, again before we recorded, as as you did as well. Yeah. But I was, you know, once I got through the episode, I was like, oh, there's a Ready Room episode for this. I was like, let's go through that. And they started talking about the dog that appeared in the original series with the unicorn horn and the antennas and the whole thing. And they were like, we were going to give the dog a unicorn horn. I'm like, oh, that would have jumped the shark. It would have jumped the shark and the series would have ended right there. But they play this so well. And that dog is so well trained that it's just, okay, I'll wear the cape and mom's holding me. All of this is fine, I think. (laughs) <laughs> totally totally it was it was and i obviously the other thing is is that i'm sure the costume designers that work on star trek i mean i mean look no offense the costumes are great with the normal you know uniforms but they do look a little bit like you know the star trek lululemon collection um <laughs> that's, so i but that's to make uh, gowns and these other costumes that are so elaborate and like they can do something that's simple, but also complicated. Mm, and then mm-hmm. they can do something just incredibly elaborate. I'm sure they, it was fantastic. It was oh, just yeah. fantastic. The co- I'm just like, as a drag queen, I'm like, I want all of this. Oh, for <laughs> sure. I Looking at some of the details, I mean, and I'm, I'm not really into cosplay. My cosplay experience has been minimal and lackluster so far, <laughs> but Same. like looking Same. at, looking at, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at some of the things, I I couldn't help but just be so impressed with all the tiny little details in the sleeves and the the bead work and you know this wrinkled leather that we put together and we three and we three D printed like half of this stuff and it's just oh my <laughs> gosh like it's so impressive. One more thing about uh, the comedic timing and you mentioned um, Hemmer. He yes. gets he gets to chew a lot of scenery in this as well. And I'm so glad like Bruce Horick, um, you know, even though he's, you know, well, I don't I, you know, the fate of Hemmer is is well known for those who yeah. know, but like I won't get into that too much down the road. We're we're almost there anyway. But um I'm so glad that they gave him these wonderful opportunities for him to shine because man, he knocks it out of the park, don't you think? He does. He really does. And I actually, I I didn't know this um, at the time, but I didn't realize that uh, Bruce Hemerak was blind. Yeah. And I, I love that they incorporated in his character. And I think that that's something that I find so wonderful about Star Trek, that they can cast an actor with a disability um, mm-hmm. and that we need, we need, people need that representation. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why they, didn't continue with his character longer, but I do know he he did make some uh, appearances as a different character in 
season two but yes yes but yeah <laughs> i mean and he has that too i mean like even with the older episodes the one we uh with him like in pike's quarters and the crew gets together and he's like kind of being offended by what aurora is saying is hilarious we actually incorporate that into a mix um oh, fun and uh it's actually okay i'll describe it because it is kind of funny so it's like we have like it's like aurora and she's talking to Hemmer and um and she's like like he's like you've offended Hemmer and then she's like can I help you like with what you're doing because it's kind of we kind of flip it around a little bit the the dialogue yeah and it goes into this loud banging and screaming because it goes into the episode um where they uh the, the episode of Voyager where um uh ne- the people that can read your mind, your thoughts. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and so it's like kind of has this like A, B, A storyline and B storyline. And it's like an opportunity to have Janeway and Ahura do a thing together. You have to see it. But uh, yeah, anyway, I digress. Oh, no, that, no, that's that's wonderful. And, and that's the other thing, like as 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 my as this podcast has gone on. I've been so impressed. I mean, the the franchise is is wonderful. Uh, you know, there's no escaping that. It, it's it's amazing. But the thing that's uh, one of the things that's really impressed me is all the fan art that has been inspired by the franchise in everything that you can imagine. Of just like, yeah, the regular stuff, enamel pins, t shirts, and uh, you know, jewelry of different kinds. But then you've got like star trek um lego builders and for people who don't yeah. know like they don't make lego star trek stuff like lego doesn't have that license so fans are having to independently build their own ships out of legos and they look great not to mention other you know painters and designers and tattoo artists costumers like the Star Trek cosplay that is out there in the world blows my mind. So like getting to see all of these things. And when I, when I see an episode like Elysian kingdom where yeah. the, the costumes are so intricate and there's all these little, these, these little things about them. I always cross my fingers of like, God, I hope I see somebody knock this out of the park in cosplay. This looks so cool. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, looking at uh you know looking at this different genre within a genre we we it, it's no secret that this episode leans heavy on the fantasy genre and in more recent years with uh the uh the popularity of things like critical role and dimension 20 the resurgence of uh dungeons and dragons and of course things like Lord of the Rings and uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and those classic books getting turned into blockbuster movies. The fantasy genre is alive and well and very strong in pop culture. Not, uh, you know, oh my God, I missed Game of Thrones. Like, yeah, it, it, that another one, you know. So uh, how do you, you know, being that to proudly go and your um your drag persona is so heavily steeped in science fiction yeah. do you have any thoughts about the fantasy genre and its place in pop culture when it's juxtaposed with the sci-fi genre or other genres how do you feel about the fantasy genre well i admittedly i it's not that i i i do enjoy it i hmm. would have to say i am definitely more like in that sci-fi, like, you know, space, you know, Star Trek type world. I mean, like, I obviously love Star Trek. I do like Star Wars. So sorry, everyone. It's um, okay. This is a safe place. <laughs> and uh, and the Orville. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I really like this kind of space exploration thing. So I don't really go. My vibe isn't as much in the fantasy genre, but I do, I do appreciate having this moment you know because i don't think star trek never takes itself too seriously Mm, um there's always mm -hmm. time for levity time for fun and that's what i appreciated about this episode and that um sort of crossover moment you know yeah um but but i do agree like there is a lot of those themes um with these other uh fantasy 
shows it's almost like i was thinking like also kind of like lord of the rings they had to find the the what are the, the mercury stone the, yeah the mercury stone yeah it's like you know they had to get their precious <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right oh my gosh i didn't even think of that <laughs> and i kind of like you know like just like the way that they kind of had this subtle sort of dressing up of the sets of like making it more fantasy stuff i actually was like because the tech sort of mind of mine i was like looking at the floors so i'm like that is a lot of dry ice <laughs> like i wondered <laughs> i wondered how slippery the floors got yeah because <laughs> you yeah. could see moisture on those floors but <laughs> you know it's it's so fascinating to see uh the resurgence of the fantasy genre um yeah especially through dungeons and dragons like i'm a big D D player and yeah. i you know living in the south the uh the satanic panic was is honestly uh still kind of a big thing here so uh, you, every now and then it yeah yeah you'll catch a side eye from somebody of like dungeons and dragons like uh yeah uh, <laughs> like critical sounds- role raised over 11 million dollars why don't you take the foot off the gas <laughs> like it's it, it's fine um it's like the spanish flu or something <laughs> oh my gosh but it's it's fun to see like a lot of the crossovers and mashups of different things like seeing I I always loved going to uh, conventions uh, when I could and seeing, hey, somebody's done a pirate version of a Starfleet uniform or they've done a steampunk stormtrooper, like seeing the mix. Yeah. yeah, the mixing of those different genres. And I always loved. Uh, you know, when Star Trek would venture into other time periods, I guess this kind of gets into the more the time travel episodes, but, you know, the original series, of course, Gene Roddenberry served in World War II and World War II yeah. was a, a, obviously a big, a big catalyst for a lot of storytelling in that era. Hell, it's, it yeah. still is. Yeah. Um, but then you see stuff like, uh, you know, the Atomic Age in like the 1950s and then. Yeah. You know, you'll even see, quote unquote, modern day, um, you know, be it the 60s, the 90s, you know, uh, the 20s. Um, and, I, you know, I always loved to kind of seeing those characters out of place. You know, you see there's that episode of Voyager where uh, the the away team lands in the 90s in San Francisco and they they interact oh. with uh, Sarah Silverman at the at the planetarium and. And all that stuff, but you know, in your pants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but even in the fantasy genre, like you mentioned, uh, the Cupid episode, and yeah. you know, there's the episode where um, uh, Data is learning about the human experience through Shakespeare. So you get a little bit yeah. of that uh, medieval uh, uh, type of type of vibe there. It's you know that's that stuff's always been prevalent and i always think about types of stories that can be told regardless of time period um yeah. one of my favorite one of my favorite science fiction movies is minority report and oh, yeah. you know super far flung future tom cruise steven spielberg it's a big you know feast for the eyes in terms of sci-fi but at the end of the day at the end of the day it's a murder mystery also, thank you for the reminder. I have to go feed my precog in the bathtub. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> what do you feed a precog? <laughs> um, I no idea. I, hope, I, hope. I have to That's pull what, out the directions. <laughs> I'm just I feed them hope that they'll get out of the bathtub eventually. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you going to get out of here or can I shower? <laughs> okay, I'll just do it over you. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. So and we've already mentioned a little bit about some of these uh, some of these actors who are who are already playing characters, getting a chance to, as those characters, embody another character, um, you know, it's drag on top of drag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as some as somebody who regularly embodies other characters, uh, how do you feel about seeing Anson Mount as this slimy, weaselly guy and seeing, uh, you know, Uhura, who's 
sort of a beacon of light playing the evil queen and uh you know all, all the entire cast really get a chance to kind of break out of their normal uh routines uh what do you think about these actors playing against in as characters playing against their characters <laughs> i think it's just about time that they're playing their authentic self um i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I the thoughts and opinions of Heather Wood do not necessarily <laughs> reflect the thoughts and opinions of Computer Resume Podcast or her affiliates. <laughs> Liar. Um, <laughs> um, I I uh, I think you, you can tell they're having a lot of fun, oh, you know, yeah. because yeah. it's over the top, it's ridiculous, and it's just you can tell they're. I mean, I often wonder, like, when they do the different takes and stuff, if they just like they. It's like they have the cut right before they're bursting out into laughter. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite sort of scenes, and I'm sure they did it so many times, it's with TNG when Riker is uh, learning for this role that Beverly's doing, or the play that she's uh, producing. Yeah. and. Like, it's like, well, I guess you're becoming a real actor. And I'm sure, like, they had to, yeah, I'm sure they're bursting into laughter after every take. Oh, and you could God. see that in this. And I think I think that's quite enjoyable to have that, that mm. light, that fun. Yeah. See actors enjoying what they're doing is fun. Not to say they don't enjoy the, the work and the other types of episodes when they're playing their actual character but right. um but yeah i i love that yeah it's it is you know you can i mean there's there's no shortage of stories about hollywood sets where so and so was a nightmare to work with but you hear um you know when you see the press junkets there's always the telltale sign of what's it like to work with uh we'll just say uh, well it's not like he's going to come after me. We'll say it. Bruce Willis. Like, what's it like to work with Bruce Willis? And when you see the response of, well, Bruce is Bruce. That means he's a nightmare to work with. <laughs> so like, you know, and again, I, as a, you know, that's more of an example rather than a specific target. He's I mean, not. I, the to I totally get it because I mean, like, I think, to be an actor, you have to have some level of ego because oh, yeah. you have to be able to take a piece of your brain and put it aside, the doubt mm. and everything to commit to something. And you can't really think to in your head yeah. about what it is you're doing. And it yeah. has to involve some sort of confidence and an ego. And I think that that's totally understandable. It's the same with drag. Mm. Sometimes drag queens catch drag delusion. Um, but the thing is, they're some of the best performers out there. So there is a reason for that, for success. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, you just, it's like comes with the territory. You know, I'm very, in terms with me, like I, I hear those stories. I still appreciate the work. And mm -hmm. and I do think that there is, uh, you know, there's, there's limits, but, you know, it's... Uh, but yeah, like every once in a while, you know, you have to, you have to have your moment, your diva moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me ask, let me ask you this um, again. And we've, we've talked about it. This, this entire recording of, of the idea of drag stars, drag artists really being so versatile in their art form and really committing to a character. I mean, we see this on Star Trek is, you know, yeah. Anson Mount, despite what you may think he's not actually the captain of a starship like <laughs> he's an actor yeah. he's just a guy um yeah. we, we we love him dearly but he's I just a guy it's like what what else is not true the easter bunny is fake <laughs> there is no santa stop <laughs> shattering stop shattering my delusions heather <laughs> i am not a real woman <laughs> But, you know, we see we see yeah. these characters who are these actors rather that, you know, set themselves aside to embody these characters. Yeah. You as a drag performer and as a producer working with other drag performers in in many venues at, at this point, um, have you seen or have you felt in yourself then the like oh i'm in character now i or i i've 
I've embodied this character like Janeway, as you do regularly. I've taken on this part of the Janeway character. And now that is, that is part of the makeup of Heather Wood, yeah. part of the psychological makeup of Heather Wood. A oh, have you yeah. felt this in yourself or have you seen this in other performers? Um, I mean, I definitely, I don't know if I can comment on the other performers uh, as much, but I do think like, yes, like Janeway and that persona. Yes, I do kind of, you know, when you put the sort of helmet on the wig and mm. you kind of come to life and you have this stuff in your head and it's, and it's wonderful the the experience of that it's it's like change it's like it's changing like you're a different person and um i mean and to uh, respect it's not like people are like oh um heather and i'm like it's captain <laughs> like, <laughs> not like but uh i do think like when i do other characters because i also do major kira i really love performing as major kira there's just like just sometimes like with the episodes and the dialogue the the mixes with the songs and stuff they just kind of write themselves which is wonderful when it's it just it's like you can do something in like 15 minutes and yeah. creating something but um i do some other characters too but i do think i gravitate um towards you know well bitches um <laughs> <laughs> hey listen i did somebody has to right <laughs> yeah i did i really love and i know probably spoiler alert but um uh commander pelia who appears in season two as um a character in and strange new worlds played by carol uh kane um yes. but uh i really love that character i tried to do her at one of the shows and i just could not get there it was like it just like enjoy watching it. But for me, I felt like I was just not connecting as much. And I think it's because it's so different from the other characters. I think I'm more drawn to, um, you mm. know, yeah, there's some subtlety and there's some differences, I think, in terms of what I'm trying to do. Um, but uh, but that was a stretch. That was that was difficult. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but I love the character and I basically have been like any other drag queen that wants to do this the, part of the show, take it. It's yours. I tried that hat on. I don't know if it's for me. <laughs> and to be, to be fair. I remember seeing the interviews and comments and uh, social media posts from Star Trek cast members going, Oh my God! Can you believe the legendary Carol Kane is is joining us on Star Trek? This is insane. So, like, Carol Kane, a uh, big shoes to fill. Like uh, the most, yeah. uh, like uh, to be honest, like even myself sitting here watching an episode. If I'm in the living room and Cat is, uh, you know, in her office or the kitchen or somewhere else in the house, uh, and Carol Kane pops up on screen, I always go, Carol Kane. <laughs> and, but it, and as and as soon as I do, I can hear Cat wherever she wherever she is in the house. Go, I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, yeah, it, it's you know yeah it, you know some of these characters or some of these actors come in larger than life. I think to be honest, that might have been one of the points that although maybe it helped it get off the ground maybe it wasn't as beneficial in the long run for enterprise scott bakula scott bakula was a star it is a star and he oh. came so it was i think it was kind of hard for people to kind of distance like sam beckett from quantum leap like sam is on star trek now like what i i don't think people were able to see past that as opposed to somebody like Shatner, uh, you know, Stuart, Kate Mulgrew, um, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, and every and ev every other person that really jumps into the seat uh on a starship, they tend to be kind of folks who are character actors or soap stars who are kind of at a interesting period in their career. You know, Celia yeah. Rose Gooding, you know, comes from music, you know, it's one of the reasons, yeah. One of the reasons, uh, you know, Subspace Rhapsody is so good. Like, she's a hell of a yeah. singer. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, I, I, I actually think, and I think uh, touching on that, um, just 
I agree with you. And I actually, I love Enterprise. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that it was such a great show. I feel like there's some Enterprise hate out there. And I'm like, oh my God, it's okay. It's been a long road. <laughs> Get over it. Very, very. <laughs> <laughs> you you but, are absolutely right. Yeah. It's it was a great show. I mean, like, and you know, I it's a shame it got cut off too soon. Um, oh, very. But I would I and I feel get I've met some of those actors uh, from Enterprise. They're wonderful. They are so nice. I, I think Scott Bakula is so fascinating. I really loved his character. I love the way he portrayed the the show. He's very thoughtful intellectual person mm -hmm. um so i mean like what a great casting for a captain because yeah. i think when you embody these characters you kind of have to have the right person too because they need to carry on the spirit of star trek on and off the screen it's a big so, responsibility and yeah. you could have people that really are not <laughs> they're they they don't they're not doing that as as well yeah. you know and so but i always say like one like speaking of characters that i have not played but i want to but i will have to admit in, in this episode um rebecca romaine number one she's not really in it as much and i feel like in stranger worlds i just if paramount's listening i want more rebecca romaine and yeah. uh, and I but I did like how they definitely went on lesbian vibes with <laughs> with her and Melissa. And I really thought they're like, oh, we know each other real well. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> I thought that was really funny and cute. But because uh, actually when they greet each other in the hallway. I was like, are they going to make out? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but, <laughs> but I really wanted to see a little bit more, but yeah. I'm sure they have reasons for those choices and stuff. But I think I want to see um, like more things where uh, number one is in command. You know, she's on the bridge. She's in the chair. I know we've seen it, but most of the time I feel like she's kind of like walking around through the ship. But yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. You know, I had this discussion with somebody recently that um, it's it's interesting to look at the dynamics because just like we just finished talking about with Scott Bakula being a well-established star become before becoming the captain of the Enterprise, yeah. arguably Rebecca Romaine was a bigger star than Anson Mount coming into this. Yeah. So it's interesting to see. And again, you know. Talking about having big shoes to fill, she's playing the role started by Majel Barrett. Like, yeah, uh, you know, the big shoes to fill for sure. So, and I do think they, I, I think everybody is going to get their moment. And I think, I think we've seen quite a bit of that through uh, more in season two with Una, but I, I'm right there with you. I hope we get just buckets more with these characters every single one of them every single one of them yeah i, I know there's been a big push for like you know the hashtag more tagus uh movement. Oh, yeah. every, I, everybody wants to see more of erica and and she's and she's a great character who has not really gotten her due just yet so i i hope that what they're planning i i hope it lives up to our expectations and that's that's where you kind of like have to I, I, I find as a fan, I'm kind of like, okay, let's rein this in because if I set my expectations so high and they don't meet or exceed, then I'm going to be disappointed and it's going to, you know, taint my view of the show. But again, talking about setting a high bar, Strange yeah, no. New Worlds, more than any new Trek series, I would venture to say. And certainly more than uh, any other series prior to New Trek, Strange New Worlds came out swinging. Like it was, it was good from the word go. And maybe that's because we got a season of Discovery that prominently featured Pike leading, yeah. leading us into that. But uh, you know, I do. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I want, I want so much more with all of these characters. And I think the reason, like, I really like Ortega's because the Ortega's character because it is. 
a new, a new character. I think mm. there are a lot of characters that they have that are from, you know, originated elsewhere that they are trying to recapture that lightning in the bottle. Right. I'm not saying that they haven't, but um, I, that I just love, like, it's somebody new. It's somebody we can also, like, fall in love with. And I'll say I have... I have a little crush on Artegas. I will. I'm not afraid to admit it. And I actually, I think I'm excited. I think she, like you, will be at Trek Long Island. I will. Then, That's true. And I will be there. And I believe Melissa will also be there. I know. I I so, had a I had a moment earlier. It was just like, okay, if we meet Melissa Navia, we are not going to try to pick her up, even though she's so teensy. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do I that. I want to walk out. Of I want to walk out of the floor as Janeway and be like, so I understand you drive the ship. Does that mean you can't get me a cup of coffee? (laughs) (laughs) Tom used to do that for me all the time. Uh, (laughs) I, I'm super excited. Well, uh, you know what? Let's let's save Trek Long Island love for for a little bit later. Um, You know, folks, we've been going through. We've been going through this episode and just showering this production, this episode, these actors uh, with a lot of love today. But as we do every episode, lovingly, we ask the question, who do we blame? This episode was written by Akila Cooper and Onitra Johnson. Now, Akila Cooper, we saw uh, her last work was season one, episode three, The Ghosts of Illyria, which we discussed with executive producer Kat Davis back on episode 120. But Onitra Johnson is uh, new to the franchise, and looking up her resume, she is one of these anomalies, uh, kind of like the Nebula we encounter, a unique unique person in the franchise in that this is essentially her first credit. Like, she's done some stuff on... uh, some shorts, she was an assistant, and she did some grip work, but... This is her first big credit writing in the franchise, but it is not her last. So we will see her again. Uh, This episode was directed by Amanda Rowe. Now, I wasn't able to find a lot of information about her other than she's very nice because she's Canadian. (laughs) So we can assume (laughs) that she is a lovely, lovely individual. We're a (laughs) boat. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) She was the second unit director on five episodes of the short-lived Minority Report series, which, uh, you know, I haven't ventured into the Minority Report series, and it's because I love the movie and the original story so much that I'm like, ah, if it's not good, I don't know that I'm really going to like this. Have you have you had an experience like that where it's like, you know, they, they do this big movie or there's this really successful property and then okay. they do a sequel and it's like, oh, do I even bother? Because if it's not good, like, have oh, you ever felt that? Stargate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Um, My address is 1234 Fake Street, New York, New York. Oh, oh, Um, hang on. Hang on, Heather. I got this. Uh, Please feel free to send all of your hate mail to at Justin underscore Bishop on Twitter. (laughs) Wait, who is that? He's a buddy of mine, and I always just tell people to send him all my hate mail. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, yeah, I think... I don't know. I never watched the that that series. I mean, I love the movie. I wish they would have done a sequel. Mm, um, mm. I was hearing that they were going to make um it, like that Paramount had bought a, a Galaxy Quest and they were going to do a series. Oh, and it was yeah. a little bit like uh okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those I mean, Galaxy Quest is so beloved um I, largely by Star Trek fans just cuz it is such a love letter to star trek um but yeah i i mean they did some comic books for a while but i mean to be honest i don't i don't know that many people would really push hard for that like sigourney weaver and tim allen are kind of you know i mean they're they're not spring chickens and that was a long time ago Uh, unfortunately you know the wonderful alan rickman passed away um and you know hell rain wilson rain wilson went from being kind of like a nobody in that movie to like he's a big star now <laughs> so he's like Harry Mud. <laughs> yeah he's Harry Mud, and he even directed a little bit of Star Trek so yeah it's trying to trying to do th- I think if they were going to do anything with the Galaxy Quest franchise 
you have to reboot unfortunately at this point i do have a pitch oh uh, yes like please story arc for galaxy quest mm. to do a sequel movie but okay. i feel like we should save it for another time but i i want melissa mccarthy to kind of be like it's like the next generation that is su- that is I like is the captain uh, you I'd stop drilling you struck oil <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I will say I will say about Minority Report. I, I had an idea for another Minority Report movie, but it yeah. would have been a prequel movie about Tom Cruise's character as a police officer in Baltimore, just because okay. just because like before pre crime crime was really bad, but it's also this period of you know the birth of all this new technology, and of course him losing his son and his marriage deteriorating. I was like. I think there's I think there's room for a, a good story in there uh, somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's my little that's my little take on it. Anyways, uh, Amanda Rowe, the director of this episode. So she worked on the Minority Report series that was in 2015 and she would continue to get regular journeyman directing gigs in some pretty popular franchises like Marvel's Cloak and Dagger in 2019 and DC's Doom Patrol in 2020. But this is her first work in the franchise but not her last. So we will see her again. And like, I I mean, I said it earlier, some of the direction of this in terms of, you know, comedic delivery uh, by the actors, which I'm sure was in the script to a degree, but also the camera work that's involved as well. I love this episode and uh, Amanda Rowe um, having her stamp on it. It's, it's clear that she's very familiar with, genre storytelling so i really hope she continues in the star trek franchise because this is a banger of an episode um but anyways i think it's really really great that you like a part of the show if i might say like that you've done this research and you're educating your audience about these folks it's something i have never well frankly bothered to look up and i think that's really important because that's that's part of how this thing runs and how these things get created. It's not just the actors. It's the people working behind the scenes. So, and I think that that's wonderful to keep track of that. So I just thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. I I really, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like we cover the writers and the directors and usually one or two guest stars, but I folks keep in mind, there is a, just a huge horde of people behind the camera making these things happen. Like we, we championed the costuming of this episode, like go online, find the, the little special feature clips of them doing the costumes. It is so like, I'm not into costuming, but watching them go through this process is fascinating and educate educational like you know in the episodes where they where they encounter the gorn the special features with them showing you how they make not only the gorn suit but the gorn puppet and the gorn digital effects it is such a yeah. fascinating exploration as to where one ends and the next one begins and yeah so uh yeah don't let my research be the end all be all. I'm so happy to present this stuff, but look, if you're into a particular area of of production, like you'd you'd find some gold in looking up yeah. some of the folks involved in Star Trek. So, um we've got one more person to talk about and it's the guest star Sage Arendell who plays young Rukia. Now, It's not going to come as any shock, but because she is so young, her resume is a bit limited at this point. But give her time, (laughs) folks. She'll get there. Uh, But she did appear in Tales from the Hood 3 and an episode of the Chucky series. And her current reoccurring gig is as the voice of Julia in the animated uh, series Paw Patrol. So... I she she did a great job. I think her performance really tugs at the heartstrings. Uh, like as soon as she looks at Babs and says, um, you know, did you have fun, Daddy? And it was just like, OK, I'm not going to cry watching this episode of Star Trek. We are going to keep it all inside. We're going to tamp it all down and then I'll die. Like, it's <laughs> keep those emotions in check, Davis. Come on. <laughs> 
<laughs> I kind of feel like the comedy version in my head is like, I don't know, Janeway going in the halls and going into that quarters and like, oh, there's a child in here. Uh, that, I'll just go get my coffee elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's such a funny thing because talking about the captains interacting with children, of course, the most famous being like that first, the pilot episode of TNG where Picard yeah. is there with Riker. He's like, keep kids the f*** away from me I'm sorry i don't normally cuss but like that is the vibe that he is get that he is giving off of like keep them away from me and it's like oh gosh and then you know of course throughout the series you know being in the same room and, and in some instances having to react with wesley crusher and other children that are on the ship um including some of the ensigns who occasionally act like children um <laughs> <laughs> and well, still you know, disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Picard's character is like, this is a disaster. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the emergency happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's so true. Well, uh, Heather, uh, we come to the point now where we ask this question every week and I'll ask it of you. Is this essential viewing if somebody is sitting down and watching star trek for the very first time and they come to this episode the elysian kingdom is this a must see episode or is this one that they can skip well i don't think i think that if you want to it's so pivotal to mbanga's storyline it is essential i mean i really think every episode is essential i don't think you should not watch one of the others my personal opinion but yeah i definitely think this is it's very critical to his storyline mm -hmm. and his his arc so in his backstory so i think definitely definitely and it's just wonderfully performed written um so yeah it's a must see yeah i'm i'm right there with you it is absolutely expertly executed in front of and behind the camera and yeah you know and, and i it's, i won't mince words here i'll be honest when i knew that they were going to have this prequel series um on the 1701 i'm a big bones mccoy fan i like yeah that's my guy that's my doctor like okay cool and then they bring in Oh, it's in Benga. It's this different guy. Like it's not Bones. I'm like, uh, okay, well, we'll get to Bones eventually. But I wasn't, I wasn't really sold on yeah. his story. And then we yeah. see, then we see that first episode. Um, it's early on where it's revealed that he's got his daughter in the pattern buffer, and this yeah. is kind of this is kind of the second part of that where he is dealing with it and has has a, he's got a choice to make his crew or his daughter and we see that he makes the difficult choice and it pays off almost immediately which is so great because you don't when you have a loved one pass away and i i, I won't pry into in your stuff but i i will say like my mom passed away when i was 19 and it was really hard for me and you hear people say like uh, you know things work out for the best and you know something good will come of this and you certainly don't feel like it in the moment but no. now but now as a 40 year old I look back and it's just kind of like yeah it forced me to grow up it forced me to put some things in perspective and yeah I did I did eventually benefit from life the life cycle continuing you know nobody's meant to be here yeah. forever so getting to see that uh instantly happen for Mbenga while the emotions are so high of him losing his daughter while those emotions are high he gets her back and shows yeah. her or, or she shows him rather I'm okay things are yeah. good I, you know I'll be here I you know we'll visit each other we'll see each other again like that's so yeah. reassuring and you know such a comfort um of closure and yeah it's while while he was not what i expected i think his story has definitely carved a place in everybody's hearts including my own of like this this is a character to watch for sure and i hope that we do get to see this character again yes in some other season yeah. You know, because they said so. Like, we want to see them. I mean, don't they hope that they tie that storyline up a little bit more? Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I, I'm assuming you've seen through season two of Strange New Worlds. Yes. What? There's a season two. 
<laughs> yes, I have. But <laughs> us knowing what else is yet to be revealed in Mbenga's past, it calls to question uh, Rukia's age versus when those things were happening. And it makes me think, was he making those decisions as a soldier or was he making those decisions as a husband and a father? Because those two thought paths are very different or they can be. And I think even that will shed some light, uh, some more light on who Joseph Mbenga is. And I'm so, so excited for this. You know what? Uh, we've been asking an additional question here more recently, and I'll pose this to you. Uh, just because I'm interested in getting a lot of different opinions about this particular aspect. Uh, there's a lot of Star Trek out there now from the original series all the way to stuff is still being produced and we've got stuff yet to come. But let me ask you this about Strange New Worlds. Do you think Strange New Worlds is a good jumping on point for someone who has never seen Star Trek before? Hmm. You know... That's a hard question. I, yeah. I guess I would have to say that, you know, I really, I, I don't know. Um, because I think that there's, I guess it, in a way it probably doesn't matter because you're going to find things you like don't understand and you're going to ask the question and you'd just be intrigued to watch something else to like a different series to kind of get the background. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think certainly yes. Um, but I don't know if I would, I would say probably like, I don't know. I feel like everybody should watch like start at least with TNG if they can't handle TOS, which I don't understand why TOS is a lot of fun. So yeah, <laughs> so I, I mean, I would say start chronologically in like how things were made, you know? Right, right. I, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think there is definitely... It definitely begs the question, you know, it, a lot of things, there's different uh, turns. I remember in, um, you know, Spock interacting with T'Pring early on, there's kind of this, this line of dialogue that sort of begged the question. She said, you know, I'm not going to be chasing you around the galaxy uh, to, for you to marry me. And yeah. those who know, know that eh, that's not necessarily the case, but <laughs> it there's just enough i think there's just enough of a wink at the camera in that line for people who don't know to go uh something about that makes me question <laughs> so yeah i think there's a lot of things that beg questions and if you know depending depending on your level of investment uh of your time and your interest in these shows and in these characters yeah, I think it will prompt you to go watch other series. Um, are you going to get all the references all the time? I, I, you know, as a, I think I can safely say I'm a hardcore Trek fan. There's times I don't get all the references all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, that's one of the nice things about a, about an expansive franchise is you can keep yeah. visiting. Yeah. I, mean, I, I actually didn't even, I, I didn't even understand where Mbanga came from. And then I, randomly had tos on and i was like oh there he is there he is yeah <laughs> yes they did watch the series <laughs> yeah exactly well heather thank you thank you thank you so much for carving out the time to come and sit and chat and nerd out with me a little bit today uh do you have any parting thoughts any parting thoughts about the episode the series the franchise as a whole uh, your experience on the Computer Resume podcast. Any parting thoughts before we go today? Well, I just want to thank you so much for having me. This has been so wonderful and a privilege to do. Thank you to everybody that's been listening to my novice commentary. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's a wonderful episode. Trek is wonderful. Don't hate. Um on any of it, it's something there's something for everybody. In two weeks, we will be joined once again by podcaster and game master Drew Burris for a discussion of Strange New Worlds Season 1, Episode 9, All Those Who Wander, which is available exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. It's no surprise. He's a big fan of the Gorn. Yes, it's a Gorn episode, folks. <laughs> so join us for that. Now, Heather. 
where can people find to proudly go and support them, uh, see them and uh, give you all the love and handfuls of cash. <laughs> <laughs> Cause with a dollar a day, we can change the world. <laughs> um, no, no, thank you so much. Uh, you can find to proudly go to proudly go.org. That's our website or at to proudly go anywhere. There's social media. Um, you can look us up, read about us on our website. We post all of our financials and things like that. We're very transparent and we'd appreciate your support. We also have an online merch store so you can check out some merch. We got some new things coming down the pike with actually, um, we're going to have our cast shot glasses. So you can get the collection, oh. you know, for people that, um, you know, like to drink. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And where can people reach out to you directly uh, on the interwebs? <laughs> well, you can find me on Facebook. Um, uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'm the Heather Wood. I think my Facebook, somebody already had the Heather Wood. So it's I am Heather Wood. But um but yeah, you can find me there. I also have a website, heatherwood.net. Um, I probably need to update it, but <laughs> my contact information is there. You can book me for your Star Trek parties, children's birthday parties, weddings, bar mitzvahs, anything. I just want to get money. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't throw that in there. We all want to get the money. <laughs> they and <laughs> replicator rations yes yes uh, if you can throw a little latin in our way we would appreciate it but yeah <laughs> there's another one yeah and i am at mr todd a davis on all of the socials from all of us at the computer resume podcast thank you thank you thank you so much for listening and i'll see you in 10 forward on patreon and like rate review and share on all your favorite platforms feel free to send us your subspace transmissions to computer resume podcasts at gmail.com or at computer resume on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok the computer resume podcast was created and produced by mr todd a davis our logo was designed by will martin and justin bishop the opening theme was produced by Justin Bishop, and our outro music was provided with permission by Dronode. Additional music was provided by Mr. Todd A. Davis and Gary Horn, and the voice of Computer Resume Podcast and executive producer, me, Kat Davis. Hashtag LLAP. We'll see you next time. Going through a Star Trek. <laughs> We're doing Star Trek stuff in space. <laughs> We probably got some phasers and shuttle pods, and we're gonna find a brand new race. How's that for a slice of fried gold?